it's Lee and Allison from the Bar Exam Toolbox. Today we're talking about setting up a schedule to help protect yourself from self-sabotage. Well, Lee, this is self-sabotage month on the Bar Exam Toolbox. Why do we want to talk about this? Well, because we all do it. I'm sure I could come up with some self-sabotaging behavior. I did this morning, (laughs) if I really thought about it. (laughs) Some of us do it more than others, and it can really sink you on a project like studying for the bar exam, which is high stakes and not a lot of fun. So everybody's really happy to make a list of things they can do (laughs) to keep themselves from studying, basically. And people are often already burned out and tired from school or from working when they start studying. So you're not in a great place to add a whole bunch more to your life. No, I think that's totally true. And I think it's the high stakes nature combined with a generally unfunness that just makes us really ripe for self-sabotage. Because I know everyone, you know, we all self-sabotage, but I think this is really just kind of next level. And sometimes people also have these really unrealistic ideas about how much they need to study or how smoothly things are going to go or how long things are going to take. And I think that can be really hard if you hit a patch where things are not going well and suddenly it's like a downhill slide. And I think perfectionism can be a really big problem here too. Um, You know, we'll talk later about this, but I think a lot of law students are perfectionists and that is really hard on the bar exam. It is really hard because your goal is not to be perfect, which is a hard no, it's not. thing for us to remember. Um, that you could also study for 400 or more hours, which is what you're really you know, signing up to do, and still not be perfect. I think that's a really hard you know, pill to swallow. Yeah, no one is going to be perfect. And you don't need to be perfect. But I think that perfectionist tendency sometimes can really go into the self-sabotaging behavior Because people start to do things like, oh, you know, I have to know everything about this topic before I can move on. And that is just, as we'll discuss later, kind of a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Also really hard to motivate after a failure. It's bar results season. So you and I are spending hours (laughs) every day talking to folks who have just failed. And it's rough. You know, I when people pick up the phone, I can just hear the sadness in their voice. It's really hard to get going again. And, you know, it can almost be comforting to say, oh, I'm so busy. I have all these other important things to do. I can't possibly study again because it kind of lets you off the hook from having to do the heavy lifting. No, that's so true. And I think sometimes we see this with people who are working, you know, they just really can't set those boundaries with their job. And that rapidly goes into like a massive self-sabotage situation where, you know, you're working 60 hours a week and pretending to study for the bar. I mean, I kind of did that when I took my second exam. I was working at a firm and I was like, oh, I'll start studying, you know, months in advance. That did not happen. Um, So I totally understand how difficult it is, but I think that's another one that we see a lot. Yeah. It's also really important that you remember that to successfully pass the bar, you need to hold two somewhat contradictory ideas at once which is that it's a really difficult and hard test that's going to require a lot of time. I mean, you heard me mention 400 plus hours. I mean, that's a lot of time um, and effort to pass, but you don't have to be perfect. It's so hard. These two things are really hard to hold at the same time. Right. No, I think that's so true. Some people go one way or the other. You know, some people sort of say, oh, well, I'm a smart person. I'm good at taking tests. And, you know, if I just kind of dial it in a little bit, I'm sure that I'll pass. I think that was the Kathleen Sullivan problem, you know, one of the most famous California bar failures, um, wrote the con law textbook, still failed the California bar, Um, (laughs) a classic. But then, you know, other people go the other way of, I just have to study every single detail. Um, And that often results in not doing enough practice um, or just kind of going down all these rabbit holes of law that like maybe could show up. And they're probably not likely to, and they're certainly not all likely to. But if you go down that I have to be perfect route, I think you're setting yourself up for a not great situation. Yeah, I think it's a really great reality check when you're starting to study to think about what percentage of the law that you're studying is really covered on the test. You know, we um, encourage you to look at tools like Smart Bar Prep, which has frequency analyses. Also, the NCBE releases frequency um, kind of analyses they're sort of on the multiple choice where it tells you, you know, where the majority of the points are coming from. But you'll see that it's not from teeny tiny nuance law um, that right. is going to make the difference. And so when you're 
looking at getting ready to study again. And if you're struggling, reminding yourself what the end goal here is, which is to um, know a little about a lot of things and a lot about the stuff that you'll see, you know, without question, you can look at the data and that can kind of help you um, center yourself a little bit. Yeah, I think that's so true. You know, like apply the 80-20 rule here. Most of the law you need to know is the law like, you know, things like negligence, hearsay, a homicide, you know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. if you don't have a pretty good grasp on these big picture topics, like you're going to be in big trouble. But I was talking to somebody who did not pass the other day and we were kind of talking about what had happened and she's like, you know, I think I just got too bogged down in the details. And then she's like, you know, for example, and she gave me literally something I had never heard of. <laughs> and I was just like, I literally went to three years of law school and this is my job and I don't even know what you're talking about. So yeah, I would agree that you probably were too deep in the weeds here. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> this was definitely not an important thing to be spending time on. No, that's not going to be the difference maker right there. <laughs> no, definitely not. No, no, not at all. I was just like, no, that, yeah, I think you're you're definitely correct that you were paying too much attention to tiny little details because if I've never heard of it, it is not going to make or break you. The other thing, if you still don't believe us, is that you can read the directions and the instructions on the bar, which many people never even do, um, which really focuses on the analysis piece and that that's where the majority of the points are coming from. And I think that that's another thing that you can really kind of hang your hat on, which is, let's say you were doing an essay and you had the right issue, but you had the wrong law, but you applied the facts well and made a conclusion you're still going to get quite a few points for that analysis. It's not so cut and dry where they're like, fail because you made a mistake. And I think that that's really important to keep in mind that a lot of what you're doing on the test is actually that thinking like a lawyer piece that we talk about when we talk about what your job is in law school. And that's really what they're testing. And I think that's another thing you can keep in mind when you might see yourself going down the rabbit hole of just learning legal trivia, which is a huge mistake um, when studying for the bar. I agree. I mean, let's talk about some things that we see frequently. And number one on my list, because I think it is probably the biggest thing for most people, is not doing enough practice because you don't know enough law. We see this one all the time. People are like, well, I can't do any practice because I haven't learned all the law. What are your thoughts on that, Lee? (laughs) Yeah, that's a poor choice. You can um, study the law that's in the question just before you do the question. This is basically what our writing of the week program is. I mean, we we tell you the law that's on the question. So we're like, there's no, I don't know how to, what the law is because we're going to give it to you. It's pretty cool. Uh, But you can do that for yourself as you practice as well and say, "Uh uh-oh, I don't remember the hearsay exceptions, I'm going to study them and then apply them, or I'm going to use my outline and then apply them, or I'm going to try and then correct myself. There are lots of ways that you can engage in the material, none of which require perfectionism. I think that um, the legal analysis piece, which is what I was just saying, which is such a huge part of your bar exam grade, is the thing that you're practicing through the practice, through the essays and the um, MBEs. And even the MPTs, because the performance test is really testing legal analysis. So you have to practice that. That's a huge part of the exam. If you say, well, can't do that till I've got everything memorized. Well, then it's probably going to be too late. It's definitely going to be too late. I mean, that's the reality. I know everybody thinks like, oh, there'll be a point where I feel comfortable enough with the law to start practicing. But that point is often not really going to be reached because you're never going to feel 100% comfortable. So people literally go into the test, maybe having done like a couple of essays, maybe, maybe one PT, you know, people say, oh, I did so many MBE questions. It's oh, you know, how many? 200. I'm like, 200 mm-hmm. is not a lot. 2,000 right. is a lot. Right. <laughs> well, 2,000 is not even like a lot. That's like what you're supposed to do. I mean, right. that's even what's hard. It's like, yeah, there's this idea of like, well, I did 2,000. It's like, yeah, that's... That's like that's the goal you were supposed to do. (laughs) Like that's not like you blew it out of the park. You just did what you were supposed to do. That's great. Um, But 200 is not going to cut it. No. So I think people sometimes just have a really unrealistic idea. But I mean, you have to start practicing before you feel comfortable with all the law because you will never feel comfortable with the law. And, you know, open book is fine in the beginning, not at the end. 
There are also people who walk in never having done it closed book, never having done it timed. A lot of people tell us they only are outlining their answer. You're not writing your answer. None of that is good enough. I'm sorry. It's not. No, it's really not. We also see that folks will often not do anything because they're so overwhelmed and stressed out. They don't know where to start. I mean, not knowing where to start is something that happens to all of us whenever you've got a big problem. You know, I think this was a great reminder for me when we recently were meeting and coming up with some new kind of strategies of how we were going to do a lot of this content that we're doing right now. And you and I sat down and we organized the project and we created this to-do list. And then the next day I came to work and was like, I'm going to go through my to-do list. And I was just so productive and got all of this work done and created all of this great content because we had a plan and we knew where to start. And so often there's the stumbling block of sitting down and creating the plan, which can be very overwhelming, but you can always break it into, you know, tiny morsels. So you're not, you know, taking on like the whole to-do list for the whole week or even the whole to-do list for the next day. But you do have to kind of make a decision about the next thing you're going to do or what you're going to do when you show up in the morning, because just sitting around and like making lists or researching what your study schedule should be or deciding where you're going to study, like all of that is just ripe for self-sabotaging, time-wasting. Oh, definitely. And we'll talk in a little bit about how you can make a good solid schedule to help you with this. But definitely having one, I think, is the key because, yeah, you don't want to be spinning your wheels every day. Like, am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? And sometimes we see people sabotaging by blindly following a schedule or an approach that somebody gave them, whether it's a course or a school or whoever, you know, your mentor, and doing stuff that you know isn't working. So, you know, there's a balance here too, because of course you don't want to get up every day and wonder like, am I doing the right stuff? But if at some point you're realizing like, you know what, this doesn't really seem to be moving the needle for me, that's when you have to take the step back and say, okay, I need to have a different plan. The other thing we see along those lines is people love to do the things that they're good at or that they're comfortable with. That are very satisfying. Yeah, that's so satisfying. You're like, oh, I am great at con law. Like I'm getting 95% of the MB questions right. I'm knocking this out of the park. Yeah, you don't need to practice that anymore. You need to go practice the stuff you're bad at. So yeah. that's the other problem with kind of blindly following a schedule is that schedule wasn't really made for you. It was just made for a general person probably. And that person, they may not know that you're great at one topic and terrible at another one. So you've got to use your own judgment to make sure you're using your time on the things that are actually going to be helping you get better and not just making you feel better. Lectures are classic for this, right? Yeah. Oh, I did five hours of listening to lectures today. I was so productive. But did I learn anything from that? Can I do a question? I mean, there's follow-up work to like the, wow, I did spend all these hours doing all of this work. I'm not saying that some people shouldn't do the five hours of lectures, but make sure you're getting something from it. But that is, I think, the classic, like, well, I've done all the lectures and I've passively listened. So through osmosis, I should be prepared. (laughs) <laughs> and it just yeah, doesn't definitely. work that way. There has to be heavy lifting, um, unfortunately. Yeah. And sometimes people, I think, think they can kind of coast by, like we said, because they're a smart person. They went to a good law school. We see this a lot. But the reality is that law school probably did not actually prepare you to pass the bar exam. Like I went to True. a highly ranked law school. They didn't talk about the bar. We had no idea what was even on the bar. I didn't mm-hmm. take classes that involved the bar. Like I didn't take closed book exams at all. I was not a person who was really prepared for the bar exam without having to study for it. Just because I went to a good school was not going to make me pass. Yeah, no, so true. Also, overstudying is a big problem. And I've recently spoken to a few people who s- said, you know, I don't know what else I could have done. And I think that that can be a really frustrating, scary place to be when you feel like you have put your heart and soul and all your mental energy into studying. The reality is, is that you have to be very thoughtful about how you're studying. And if you are studying every waking moment of every day, or if you are not sleeping or doing all of these things, your brain is not able to retain that information. And so just, again, like clocking hours isn't the same thing as productive study time. So if you feel like you are spending every waking hour studying, you're probably going to get burned out and then not be that ready for the exam on exam day. Right. And the reality is you're probably also pretty deep in the weeds at that point and might have lost sight of the big picture. I mean, that's what we see with overstudying is people like, yes, you put in a ton of time and effort. You memorized a lot of stuff. 
but you kind of lost sight of the big picture. And that can also be a problem, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, let's see. Oh, one of my other favorites is all the other life tasks. So let's say you've decided to study for the bar while moving, getting married, getting divorced, family drama, breakups, medical emergency with a family member. I mean, life happens and sometimes you're like dealt a hard hand, but we hear a lot of people plan big stressful life events in conjunction with studying for the bar, which is not a great idea. Yeah, I think the marriage one is the classic one. I talked to someone who was like, well, I was getting married and then I had a reception the next time I took it. And it's like, okay, you know, maybe next time we won't have those happening. <laughs> maybe we can focus. But, you know, things happen. But I think there are a lot of things you can plan to not have happen that would probably really behoove you. And if some of these things do happen, I think you have to think really seriously about, do you need to postpone this test? You know, if a family member is very seriously ill, that might be a reason that you don't take this test. Mm -hmm. I also think moving is the one that a lot of folks sign up for, you know, and it can be like not necessarily like a move that takes a weekend. It'll be like, I'm moving from New York to California. And you're like, well, that sounds like a lot. So <laughs> Right. Or like, or like, there's one thing is like, okay, you're moving, you have, you know, movers come or you don't have a lot of stuff right. and you can settle in quickly. There's another one that's like, well, I'm moving and I don't have a place to live and I have to find a place to live and I've got to put all my stuff in storage and I'm not really sure how I'm going to do that. It's like, oh, that is probably not going to go <laughs> too well. much. Too much. Yeah, it's too exactly. Much. And it's hard because yeah. a lot of people do have to move out of wherever they've been living in law school. But, you know, maybe it is that you get a temporary situation for a few months. And we've even had people like go off to, you know, nice beaches and study and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like be creative rather than having to try to set yourself up for this insane situation. Uh, it's probably just not going to go well. Yeah. But seek stability of some kind, <laughs> whatever it Calmness, might be. Calmness, something calm, <laughs> calm, whatever that means to you. <laughs> Yes. Calm, focused, like focused. not a lot of drama. That's what we're looking for. Yes. All right. Well, we've talked about a lot of the common things. Oh, but do you know one that we have left off the list, which is one of my favorites as well, What's is that? the binge watching Netflix, because this can be a slippery slope. We all love a good Netflix binge, I'll be honest. But you can really start to lose hours and hours a day. And this one doesn't usually involve losing study time, but it involves losing sleep. And sleep mm. is critical to your brain capacity. And if you find yourself watching, you know, because Netflix just gives you the next episode, right? And then all of a sudden it's like one o'clock in the morning and you've watched three episodes of Love is Blind. I'm, I'm <laughs> not from personal Been experience there. or anything. <laughs> I will admit to the other night actually watching an episode of Married at First Sight. And I was like, I cannot believe I'm devoting two hours of my life to this, but I also can't stop it. Yes, I know. So anything that will just feed you the next episode is very dangerous because the hours can just kind of disappear. And we also know that watching Blue Light before bed is not great. And that can really end up hurting your sleep. So just be aware of it. It can happen, and if it happens once, create scaffolding so it doesn't happen again. And it might not be Netflix. It might be TikTok or Instagram or the mm -hmm. news, like whatever your personal, like, get in bed with your phone thing is. And like most of us do it, but it is something to keep an eye on because if you're not getting sleep, things are not going to go well. All right. Well, let's switch gears a little bit. Quickly talk about how can a good schedule help you avoid self-sabotage? Well, number one, like we talked about, it tells you what to do, which is kind of step one. Um, yeah. The other thing I think is really important is if you sit down and really try to think through what's necessary at the start of your study or when you reach a point where you realize what you're doing is probably not working, you're probably going to make better decisions about what future you needs to do than when you're tired and stressed out later. So, you know, you might, and it might be something simple as blocking out, you know, say three to four hours a day to do practice. If you make that decision in week one, all you have to do is carry it through. But if every day you're sitting, you're saying, oh, I just don't know what I should be doing. And oh, I don't really feel like doing that. I'll do it tomorrow. I think that those are not going to be probably your best decisions. Yeah, a lot of folks really like kind of the blocked scheduling, um, which can also mimic the exam 
scenario, which is also kind of nice. You know, do let's say your target is to study eight hours a day. You do a three hour block. You take a lunch break. You do a three hour block. You take a little break and then maybe do a little bit more and then you're done for the night. And you can say that some of those, you know, one of those blocks might be substantive review. One of those blocks might be practice. One of them could be multiple choice. There are lots of ways that you can set up that structure, but also kind of assigning those blocks can be very helpful. Um, Or maybe you need hour long blocks. Maybe you're somebody who can't manage a three hour block. You just have to give yourself feedback so you can adjust and figure out what's working for you. Just don't go down the path of saying like, wow, this is really overwhelming and I'm not getting anything done. And then wait, you know, two to three weeks. And then you're like, well, the exam's in six weeks. I don't know. It's not going well. (laughs) And I'm not getting anything done. Right. And you can use those blocks to regularly schedule active tasks, which I think is really the key here. So it's not an eight-hour day of like watching videos. Minimum half of your day should be spent doing something active, whether that's writing, practice MBEs, et cetera. And the other thing is this, you know, if you kind of plan this out in advance, it lets you break up these really big tasks into more manageable chunks and also get real about what you need to do. So, you know, we mentioned earlier 2,000 MBE questions is kind of the goal. I mean, how many is that every day or every week? Are you studying 10 weeks? Okay, well, that's basically 200 questions a week or 40 questions a day if you do them five days a week. So, like, that's actually quite a lot. You know, that's going to take probably half of your day. So, Rather than doing, you know, people say, oh, I did 10 questions a day, that's probably not actually getting you really anywhere close to that goal. And of course, you can subtract out if you're doing a practice test later or whatever. But, you know, say 30 per day, I think is mm-hmm. probably a pretty good, pretty good estimate of what you're going to need to do to get to that goal. But it also helps you think about, you know, maybe you could start a little bit earlier. Maybe you could spread this out a little bit more. Maybe you could do some of this during your third semester of law school or something like that. Or if you found out you failed, you know, If you start a few months earlier, then you've got to do less. But I think just getting real about what that actually looks like in the end and then breaking it down day by day is a really helpful thing to be scheduling. I agree. And I think you can think about it as like deposits in the study bank. If you are worried that you're not going to get your 200 questions deposited, (laughs) you need to start before. And a lot of folks don't think about the fact that the MBE programs usually give you access to your season right before the next bar, like right after the last bar is done. So if you have gotten bummer news and you're like, well, it's October, I can't possibly start studying now, you're going to pay no more money to just sign up now. And then what if you did 50 questions a week, which really isn't that many when you really think about it, if you're like doing, you know, a few a day, 50 a week for the next eight weeks. That's quite a significant deposit in the practice bank. And so I do think that balancing this worry with overstudying and getting burned out is also this idea of like, well, maybe I can actually start chipping away at this big problem um, a little bit earlier without stressing myself out to study so much, but I'm going to get myself towards these goals. And then it's not going to feel quite so intimidating when I get much closer to the test. Right. Because the reality is at some point there just aren't enough hours in the day. If suddenly you're at the end and you're like, oh, I need to do 200 questions in a day. That's not really physically possible. (laughs) It's just not. It's not going to be good. No. No. And I think having a good schedule also lets you track how things are going so you can iterate. So sometimes people, you know, we talk to say, oh, I'm working and studying and I'm going to study four hours a day every night and then we do every weekend. A, that's probably not realistic. You need some (laughs) breaks. But yeah. if you get a couple of weeks into it and you realize that like, oh, things just keep coming up, you know, I'm only able to study like three hours a night, three times a week. Okay, that's pretty valuable information because you need to iterate and figure out how to use your actual study time or how to create more study time, maybe by working less or something like that. But you have to make adjustments or otherwise, you know, you're just going to be going further and further off the rails. It can also be great to set up a reward structure for yourself. I mean, who doesn't like a gold star? But you can (laughs) have all kinds of different rewards, whatever works for you, from tiny rewards, which is like, I mean, we've heard it all, like the M&M once you finish an MBA question or whatever. Taking time with family, friends, your dog, go to a movie, do get a massage. There can be lots of things that you can work towards. And there are even apps that we've mentioned on the podcast before 
um, that will help you kind of unlock these rewards. I don't know that we all need an app, but if you need one, they're out. Somebody has made one for you. Um, but I do think that reward structure of saying like, let's just get this stuff done so I can go do the rest of my life is um, a great thing to keep in mind. Yeah, I was always a fan of giving myself like a buy right ice cream cone because that meant mm-hmm. I got to walk down towards the park. I would like get the, you know, if I did X, Y, and Z, if I got this done, I would walk down a few blocks, get the ice cream, walk around the park and then come home. And by the time I got there, you know, I've been outside for 30 plus minutes. I've taken a walk. I've gotten the ice cream. I'm like jazzed on my sugar and I'm like <laughs> ready to go for the rest of my day. But it can be very motivating, I think, whatever it is. And like really here, honestly, pretty much whatever works. Although probably not shots of alcohol, not a great plan. Yeah, that's probably um, but, bad. you know, anything that's not going to basically totally mess you up, I think, is fair game here. This is, yeah. this is a time to be self-indulgent. It's true. It's true. All right. So we've been talking vaguely about what goes into a good study schedule, but I think it's always good to dive into some of the details. So in a good study schedule, you have a reasonable amount of study time daily. So, Allison, what is reasonable? That's kind of like the reasonable person, Lee. It just really depends. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I think you have to look at your life. You know, are you working? Are you studying full time? That's going to look really different. Uh, I think you have to look at how long you personally know that you're able to focus. Most people probably can't really focus more than about six, maybe eight hours a day. If that, probably not eight. I'm thinking that's an, you know an overestimate, but you know, you've only got this core of like really solid study time, and then there are other things you can do. You know, when are you trying to study and is this realistic? So are you studying late at night? Are you trying to study first thing in the morning? You've got to think through what works best for you. And the most critical thing I think I would say here is you want to keep things simple and you want to focus on the high value work. So it may be that you do less time, but that time is more valuable because I think that's going to let you do other things, um, which, you know, I think things like breaks that we've already kind of touched on, stuff like that is really important. And you have to be doing high value work if you're going to have time to do those things. Yeah. I mean, think about it like billable hours, right? I mean, would right. would you really give yourself credit for the time that you're putting in? <laughs> Are you actually like working and producing something? And I think if you think of it that way, it's it can be more helpful to say like, okay, well, I put in six really solid hours of work. And for some people, that might be all that you have. Or if you're working and studying, it could be two hours of really valuable um, work. But it needs to be really valuable work. And I think that's the thing um, that you can get kind of suckered into, which you're like, I'm in the library or I'm in my office. So this counts. And it only counts if you're doing the work. Right. I spent 12 hours a day like sitting in front of a video, really caught up today. It's like, Mm -hmm. okay, you A, probably weren't retaining that information. And also it probably wasn't that productive. You probably could have learned that material in a faster way. So I think, you know, you need a realistic approach to learning the law. Like we talked about earlier, you do not have to know everything. So I think everyone needs a set of shorter outlines than what they might have been provided through a big company. You know, if you're looking at like a telephone book, of material that you're supposed to learn that is not realistic. So you've got to get these shorter outlines. You've got to use attack plans and things like that to really help you hone in on the key issues and practice the heavily tested topics before you move into the weeds here, because that is what's really going to kill you. Yeah. And practice applying the law like and connecting it. I mean, our listen and learn episodes are super popular um, on the podcast. And I think the reason why they're super popular is not just because people love listening to me talk, but they're very popular because they are about linking law to facts. And that is what you're doing in the practice. And I think it is so hard for many of us to sit down and force ourselves to do that. And if you listen to these podcasts, I can kind of hold your hand and like force you to do it, like walk you through it. But it's still different to do the heavy lifting yourself. So when you're setting up your time for practice and active learning, you can use those listen and learn episodes, I think is a great kind of guidepost for what that feels like. Learn some law and then practice applying it to fact patterns and then do it again. <laughs> like that's really all that we're asking you to do. And literally all we've done is picked a few bar questions, been like, hmm, all right, these are on this topic. What's the law we need here? Let's explain mm-hmm. the law and then do the questions. It's not really super complicated. There are plenty no. of questions. If you you know, if you need more questions, you can get the Brainy Bar Bank. We've even sorted them for you. But there we have mm-hmm. hundreds of questions that you yeah. could 
basically have a short outline, something like smart bar prep and be like, okay, today I'm working on, let me see what this question is about. Oh, let me go look up that law. All right, it's time Mm -hmm. for me to write the question. Obviously, at some point you have to do them under timed conditions and close book, but not all the time and not in the beginning. I think it's a totally valid way to learn. I think you can even use the MBE questions this way. If you're Mm -hmm. struggling on the MBE, you can do those questions open book. You can do them untimed because if you do them under those conditions and you're not getting them right, there's literally no way you're going to get them right under the time conditions closed book. No. Well, I know we're running short on time. Um, any final thoughts about self-sabotage and building your steady schedule? I guess my bigger picture thought that we haven't really talked about is when you're in a situation where you feel like self-sabotage could be happening, I think it's really useful to know and understand really your why here. You know, why are you, why do you want to pass this test? Why do you want to be a lawyer? If you can keep those things kind of in the back of your mind, I think that can be very motivating as well. What do you think? I agree. I also like the idea of what will my future self think about this choice I'm about to make? Right. <laughs> You know, like, what is my bar taker self going to say when they walk into the exam room? (laughs) And and I think that that can be very powerful, too. So that is one of the things that I like to do along those lines. And I think if journaling um, resonates with you, it can be a really great way to, like, force yourself to kind of reflect and, um, and hold yourself accountable. I think one of my final thoughts is just be honest with yourself. And I think that that is something that can be really challenging to do. If you're having a hard time, be honest about it and then figure out a solution or a way out. Or if you are just wasting time because you're so tired or you're sick or you have something going on tough in your life, taking one day to regroup is better than having two weeks of crummy study. And so just really have some honest conversations with yourself about what's going on. We have had students who have appendicitis and then will say, it's okay, I can study in the hospital. And I'll say, no, (laughs) go to the hospital, stop (laughs) studying, and we will talk about it when you get home. (laughs) And that student actually ended up passing the exam, actually. But, you know, there are these moments where you're like, that's not self-sabotaging behavior. That is a crisis happening and you need to regroup. So being honest with yourself and saying like, do I really need a break? Have I pushed myself too hard? Can I regroup? Or am I just, you know, having bad behavior, which we all do see previous examples of Netflix, Love is Blind, binging, (laughs) it happens to all of us. Or, I mean, I was doing the Instagram thing where I was like, why am I on Instagram right now? I had this moment where I'm like, how did I even open the app on my phone? Why am I reading it? It's 10 o'clock at night. It happens to all of us. But be honest about yourself is going to help you make the best choices for the situation. All right. Well, with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you for joining us. Uh, You can check out barexamtoolbox.com for more helpful tips and to learn about our tutoring and course options for California and the UBE. And please subscribe. See you soon. Mm -hmm.